This is a reading from the poem of the Man God by Maria Valtorta. Volume 5, Episode 636, The Descent of the Holy Spirit, End of the Messianic Cycle, 27th of April, 1947. No voices or noises can be heard in the house of the supper room. None of the disciples are present. At least, I cannot hear anything that can authorize me to say that people are gathered in the other rooms of the houses, of the house. There is only the presence and the voices of the Twelve and of the Most Holy Virgin gathered in the hall of the supper. The room looks wider because the furniture is placed differently and leaves all the center of the room and also two of the walls free. The large table used for the supper has been pushed against the third wall, and between them and the wall, and also at the two narrower sides of the table, they have placed, placed the couch seats used for the supper and also the stool that Jesus, Jesus used for the washing of the feet. But the couch beds are not vertical to the table as they were for the supper, but parallel to it, so that the apostles can sit down without occupying all of them, and they have left one, the only one placed vertically to the table, all for the Blessed Virgin, who is at the center of the table, in the place that Jesus occupied at the supper. There are no tablecloths or tableware on the table. There is nothing on the sideboards, and the ornaments have been taken off the walls. Only the chandelier in the center is lit but only one flame is lit, the other small flames on the circle forming a corolla to the strange chandelier are out. The windows are closed and barred with heavy metal bars placed across them, but a sunbeam penetrates boldly through a tiny hole, and like a long, thin needle, it descends on the floor, forming a round spot of sunshine. The Blessed Virgin, sitting all alone on her seat, has Peter and John at her sides, on their seats, Peter on her right, John on her left-hand side. Matthias, the new apostle, is between James of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. In front of her, Our Lady has a large low chest of dark wood, which is closed. Mary is dressed in deep blue. Her hair is covered with a white veil, over which is placed the edge of her mantle. All the others are bareheaded. Mary is reading slowly in a loud voice, but as the light that arrives there is very faint, I think that, rather than read, she is repeating by heart the words written on the scroll that she is holding spread out. The others follow her in silence, meditating. Now and again they reply when it is appropriate. Mary's face is transfigured by an ecstatic smile. I wonder what she sees that is capable of inflaming her eyes like two clear stars and makes her ivory cheeks blush as if a rosy flame reflected on her. She is really the mystic rose. The apostles bend forward, sitting a little sideways to see her face, while she smiles so gently and reads, and her voice sounds like the song of an angel, and Peter is so deeply moved that two large tears fall from his eyes and stream down along wrinkles on both sides of his nose to get lost in the thicket of his gray beard. But John reflects the virginal smile and is inflamed like her with love, while he follows with his eyes what the virgin is reading on the scroll. And when he hands her a new scroll, he looks and smiles at her. The reading is over. Mary's voice stops. The rustling of the parchments rolled and unrolled comes to an end. Mary concentrates in secret prayer, joining her hands on her breast and leaning her head on the chest. The apostles imitate her. A very loud and harmonious roar that resembles the wind and the harp, as well as human singing, and the sound of a perfect organ suddenly resounds in the silence of the morning. It comes near, more and more harmonious and loud, and with its vibrations it fills the earth, propagates them, and impresses them on the house, on the walls, on the furniture. The flame of the chandelier so far immobile in the peace of the closed room flickers as if a wind were blowing, and the little chains of the chandelier tinkle vibrating under the wave of the supernatural sound that strikes them. The apostles raise their heads, frightened, and as that most beautiful rumble in which, all, in which are all the loveliest notes that God gave the heavens and the earth approaches them more and more, some stand up ready to run away, some crouch on the floor covering their heads with their hands and mantles, or beat their breasts, breasts asking God to forgive them. Some press against Mary, too frightened to keep the reserve they have always have for the most pure mother. 
Only John is not frightened, because he sees the bright piece of joy that is accentuated on the face of Mary, who raises her head smiling at a thing known to her alone, and who then slides down on her knees, opening her arms, and, and the two blue wings of her mantle so opened, stretch out on Peter and John, who have imitated her, kneeling down. But all this, which took me some minutes to describe, has taken place in less than one minute. And then the light, the fire, the Holy Spirit enters, with a last, melodious, loud noise, in the form of a very shining, burning globe, into the closed room, without any door or window being moved, and remains hovering for a minute over Mary's head, about three palms above her head, which is now uncovered, because Mary, upon seeing the fire paraclete, has raised her arms to invoke him, and has thrown her head back with a cry of joy, with a smile of boundless love, and after that moment in which all the fire of the Holy Spirit, all the love is collected in his spouse, the most holy globe splits into thirteen canorous, very bright flames, of so bright a light that no earthy comparison can describe, and it descends to kiss the forehead of each apostle. But the flame that it descends upon Mary is not a tongue of a straight flame on her forehead that it kisses, but it is a crown that embraces and encircles the virginal head like a wreath, crowning as queen the daughter, the mother, the spouse of God, the incorruptible virgin, the holy beautiful, the eternally loved, the eternally maiden, whom nothing can humiliate, and in nothing, whom sorrow had aged, but who has revived in the joy of the resurrection, sharing with her son an accentuation of beauty and freshness of bodies, of looks, of vitality, having already an advance of, a, of the beauty of her glorious body received into heaven to be the flower of the paradise. The Holy Spirit makes his flames shine round the head of his beloved. Which words does he speak to her? Mystery. Her blessed face is transfigured with supernatural joy and smiles with the smiles of seraphim, while blissful tears shine like diamonds on the cheeks of the Blessed Virgin, struck as they are by the light of the Holy Spirit. The fire remains so for some time, then it vanishes. In memory of its descent, there remains a fragrance that no earthly flower can exhale, the perfume of paradise. The apostles collect themselves. Mary remains in her ecstasy. She only folds her arms across her breast, closes her eyes, lowers her head. Her conversation with God continues, insensible to everything. No one dare disturb her. John, pointing at her, says, She is the altar, and the glory of the Lord has rested on her glory. Yes, let us not upset her joy, but let us go and preach the Lord, and let his works and his words be known to peoples, says Peter with supernatural impulsiveness. Let us go, let us go, the Spirit of God is burning in me, says James of Alphase, and it is urging us to act, all of us, let us go and evangelize the peoples. They go as if they were pushed or attracted by a wind or by a vigorous force. Jesus says, And here the work that my love for you has dictated, and that you have received through the love that a creature has had for me and for you, is over. It ended today, the day of the commemoration of St. Zita from Luca, the humble maid who served her Lord with charity in this church of Luca, where I, from remote places, have brought my little John, so that, she, so that he should serve me with charity and with the same love that St. Zita had for all unhappy people. Zita used to give bread to the poor, remembering that I am in each of them, and that blessed will they be who, side by side with me, give bread and drink to the hungry and thirsty. Mary John has given my words to those who languish in ignorance or in tepidness or in doubt about faith, remembering that wisdom said that those who work hard to make God known will shine like stars in eternity giving glory to their love by making it known and loved, and to many people. And further, it ended today, the day in which the Church raises the pure lily of the fields of Mary Teresa Goretti to the altars, the lily whose stem was broken while its corolla was still a bud, and by whom was it broken if not by Satan, envious of that purity that shone more than his ancient angelic aspect broken because it was sacred to the divine lover, 
Mary, virgin and martyr of this century of disgrace, in which also the honor of the woman is held in contempt, by spitting the slaver of reptiles to deny the power of God, to give an inviolate dwelling to his word, who was becoming incarnate by the Holy Spirit, in order to save those who believe in him. Also Mary John is martyr of the hatred, who does not want my wonders to be celebrated by the work, the weapon capable of snatching so many praise from him. But also Mary John knows, as Mary Teresa knew, that martyrdom, whatever its name and aspect are, is the key that without delay opens the kingdom of heaven to those who suffer to continue my passion. The work is finished, and with its end, with the descent of the Holy Spirit, ends the messianic cycle that my wisdom has enlightened from its dawning, the immaculate conception of Mary, to its descent, to its, to its setting, the descent of the Holy Spirit. All the messianic cycle is the work of the Spirit of love for those who see properly. It was therefore right to begin it with the mystery of the immaculate conception of the spouse of the love and finish it with the seal of the fire paraclete on the church of Christ. The revealed works of God, of the love of God, end with Pentecost. From then onwards, the intimate, mysterious work of God continues in his believers, united in the name of Jesus, in the one, holy, Catholic, apostolic, Roman church, and the church, that is, the assembly of the believers, shepherds, sheep, and lambs, can proceed without erring, because of the continuous spiritual operation of the love, the theologian of theologians, he who forms the true theologians, that is, those who are lost in God and have God in themselves, the life of God in them through the direction of the Spirit of God that guides them, that is, those who really are the children of God, according to the concept of Paul. And at the end of the work, once again, I have put the complaint that I have put at the end of each evangelical year, and in my grief, seeing my gift despised, I say to all of you, you shall not have anything else, because you have not received this that I have given you. And I also, I say also that about which I had you informed last summer, 21.5.46, to call all of you on the right path. You will not see me until the day comes when you will say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The work was finished today, 27th of April, 1947, via Reggio, via Fratti, 113, Maria Valtorta.